Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today, my guest is Victor Gemignani. Victor is a lawyer who is planting the seeds of equal justice in Hawaii, and we'll explain a little bit more as we go along what that means. Victor spent most of his professional life advocating for economically and socially disadvantaged persons. After graduating from law school, Victor worked for Vista and then in various legal aid society offices on the mainland. He eventually crossed the sea to Hawaii in 1994 to become the head of our local legal aid society. Victor is now the executive director of Lawyers for Equal Justice and is transitioning somewhat out of the position of co-executive director of Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. Welcome, Victor. Oh, thank uh, you, Mark. First of all, I'd like you to tell us what each is. What is, sure. what is Hawaii Appleseed and Lawyers for Equal Justice? And explain sure. the dynamics and where they came from. Sure. I'm going to go back in history a little bit, because okay. if you understand your history, you'll understand a little bit better about who we are. I love history. Uh, Lyndon Johnson created a thing called the War in Poverty in the 60s. And he put a lot of money and a lot of effort into designing and implementing an effort to really do something uh, important in terms of raising people out of poverty. Uh, he created the legal aid uh, system we have in this country at this point, uh, the federally funded legal aid system. So we were all uh, started getting funding from the federal government in 66, and our, one of our mandates was to represent the low and moderate income population when they were uh, confronted with challenges, structural challenges to access uh, services and, and rights that they had. Well, in 1968, 69, 70, 72, we had a Supreme Court uh, headed by Earl Warren that was incredibly sympathetic to the rights and responsibilities of uh, poor people. Um, this is the first time this ever had happened in our country where we had a legal approach to uh, protecting the rights of low-income people. But the bottom line is they came out, the Supreme Court came out with four, five, seven different opinions that were r radical in terms of uh, providing low and moderate income people standing and rights to enforce in this system, any system in the state under our, under our state and, 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 uh, and uh, national constitution. So legal aid programs started doing that. Well, in 1980, Ronald Reagan uh, became president and didn't like the idea of uh, legal aid lawyers suing the government on major cases. In fact, we were deeply involved in the Koalavia issue back in the 70s, and Beach Access came from Legal Aid Society in the state. Well, that all stopped in the 80s for all intents and purposes, and a few programs continued to do that work with separate funding. But in 1996, uh, the Ginrich Congress uh, totally banned us from doing any of that work. So I was director of Legal Aid Society at that point. In Here in Hawaii? Aid, yes, in Hawaii. And Legal Aid Society of Hawaii had always done the systemic class action advocacy, which is normally done against, against, against the government interest. And obviously, the governments don't necessarily like to be litigated against. Oh, particularly on on behalf groups. of those who couldn't afford to exactly. do it. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. we win all of our cases, and they lose all of their cases. <laughs> and they didn't particularly like that. So the bottom that line is. That would be is, discouraging. Exactly. Okay. So they eliminated, Congress eliminated from doing any more of this work. Uh, Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, I'm extremely proud to say, was the pr first program to challenge that regulation as being against uh, the Constitution, First Amendment rights of the, of the people of this state. And we had a federal judge here, Judge Kay, in Honolulu, declare it unconstitutional. That allowed us to create an affiliate that would be separately funded and separately incorporated and separately staffed. Uh, that we could do our work from Legal Aid Society of Hawaii now is the father, a grandmother, uh, and uh, Lawyers for Equal Justice was created to be the vehicle through which we were able to continue to do so, class So actions. Congress stopped Legal Aid, exactly. but the, the Judge K allowed something to run alongside exactly. it. He allowed an affiliate to be created which was prohibited by the Legal Services Corporation, and those affiliates could be created in any legal aid program in the country. So it didn't only apply to Hawaii. Oh, wow. We brought the case, but it was precedent for every other program to be Great. able to do what we did. So we created Lawyers for Equal Justice, and we ran both organizations, Lawyers for Equal Justice and the Legal Aid Society And the, the Lawyers for Equal Justice was to do those things that exactly. Congress said you can't do at we Legal can't Aid. Do. Exactly. Nice. 
<laughs> and I, we have a list of cases we can talk about at some point. Yeah, yeah. And anybody out there can try to figure out why we shouldn't be able to do these cases. They resonate with everybody in terms of things that should be brought. But for a variety of reasons, Congress wanted us out completely of systemic advocacy. So we created LEJ, had some great cases that came along. Um, it got to be around uh, 19, uh, 2003, 2004, by the way, was our first case under LHA, class action litigation against the state. Housing Authority had been overcharging tenants for about 10 years. We were able to, uh, for rent, we were able to recover about $2.3 million only because the statute of limitation only went back six years. So there were rebates given to the tenants in public housing uh, of about $2.4, $2.5 million, including their rents being reduced for the next year by about a million dollars because the rents were being calculated in the wrong way. That was our first case. And so, so nobody was helping these tenants. Oh, they were to, being overcharged. To, and, and they didn't did, even know. They didn't even know yeah. that they were being and overcharged. The, 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 well, the public housing authority had totally messed up the calculation for rent and it's had hard left. to believe the government would have messed it's up. It's kind of hard, but I will tell you more tales of okay. woe as we right. continue on our other cases that we took. Okay. Bottom line is we get to be a, a 208, 209, 210. We've been around now about eight or 10 years. And to be frank with you, it's really hard supporting this kind of litigation. Um, so there are not foundations that support class actions. And sometimes you get attorney's fees, but a lot of times you don't. For example, one case, the Micronesian Healthcare case, we went all the way to the United States Supreme Court for five years. There were no attorney's fees provided, even though we were a prevailing party for over five years, keeping Micronesians with health care uh, during the 209. They were somehow denied it because of the where, they, where they came from. Exactly. The Lingle administration during 2008, 2009, the recession, made a decision to eliminate health care for Micronesians. That was uh, picking on them because they were uh, uh, from Micronesia, uh, uh, it's uh, ethnic uh, associations, and you can't do that under our Constitution. So that's a classic case that was very long. The state fought, fought, fought. And at the end of that rainbow, we succeeded for our clients, but not got no, no money to support ourselves. Well, so I made a decision that we're really going to start to change how we do our advocacy, because a min great number of issues do not, as you know as a lawyer, have a legal solution. They have a political solution. Hmm. So we started to shift a lot of our energy towards things that had political solutions in this state. Our tax system, for example, is incredibly regressive. It's the second worst in the United States because of how it's framed. It gets half of its income from GET, and that's highly regressive for low and moderate income people. Our affordable housing is the worst in the United States, and we have no plans to ultimately get us out of it. Our food insecurity for our children is close to the bottom. For example, we're 47th worst in the United States wow. in accessing food stamps. Free, I mean, I'm sorry, food stamps in the old days. Now it's down to 32% because of a case we brought, by the way. We were almost the last in the nation during the recession uh, for getting our people who were eligible to food stamps they were entitled to because the department's practices, Department of Human Services practices were broken. So that is a, a beginning of me starting to take a look at other funding streams and try to find money that would support our non-litigation advocacy. Okay, so, so the legal yeah. free, lawyers for equal justice changed their name. Was was litigation exactly class actions exactly. mostly exactly. all right all. all class actions and then you you saw a, a light bulb went off or something and you I said I can't support this system long term. And, and, and there's other avenues, maybe, exactly. and so you, you, you wanted to change and find a different entity, and that's how the exactly. Hawaii Exactly. So we've okay. rebranded with a national network. <clears throat> so we rebranded ourselves in Hawaii as not only a litigation program, but more importantly, merging into a non-litigation advocacy program. And we had the key issues, child nutrition, affordable housing, and tax policy that we had running in our favor to be able to indicate how badly our systems are operating in terms of the impact on poor people. And are, are those issues so, supported yes. uh, there are more, key issues. More, they, more than the litigation type oh, issues? much more, much I more, see, because I foundations see. now would be interested in non-litigation partners, individual donors. We just had an Artist for Appleseed event. We raised about $95,000, and most of that money didn't come from people that would support our litigation. It came from people that enjoy our affordable housing agenda, our tax policy, economic justice agenda, and our child nutrition so agenda. So it's a different philosophy totally. entirely, and totally. you, you get people probably from all, all different walks of life that exactly. would support it. Is that, exactly. is that, is that correct? Exactly. Oh, so see. we basically put most of our energy uh, for a number of years into our, into Hawaii Appleseed because it was growing so vociferously since mm -hmm. so many people mainlanded here wanted to contribute to non-litigation advocacy. In the meantime, we continued to do litigation. So all of, for the last 10, 12 years, we've done some major, major cases, but they have not dominated our publicity and they have not dominated our funding streams. So that's kind of a political choice too, exactly. in a way, I see. Uh, if you fund by government, I've been doing this for 50 years. I've been in the legal <laughs> services system now since the war in poverty in 1969. <laughs> 
I will tell you over and over and over again, and I can tell you the woes, not only in mainland, but here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, where we get kicked back from the, the particularly the uh, finance chair of the, the House, a big time kick, kick, kick back in terms of some of the cases we've brought. Um, so we have made a decision ultimately uh, to now uh, go back and try to segregate these organizations in a way that made sense. It's uh, a strategic. Exactly, strategic plan. And can continue to litigate the cases we've already litigated with hopefully less political kickback uh, uh, here in the state than we've had in the past. Okay, so two different roads I see Absolutely. here. What is each doing and, and have, have, are, they, are they splitting apart? Is that, is that, is that what's happening here? I hope not. I've lived through these kinds of permutations a number of times in my life. Uh, and the more they're separated, the more there is a isolation of the few people that do our type of work um, so that you have less communication, you have less coordination, you have more expenses because you have to replicate all of the ingredients you need for staffing, for administrating but, uh, communications to technology, et cetera. And the collaboration's valuable. Ex totally valuable. Yeah, yeah. So it's really helpful for us to stay together. So we likely, to, and this is still under discussion by our board of directors, we likely will ha continue in the same space. We will likely have staff designated just for Hawaii uh, lawyers for equal justice for the litigation component of our program. And we will like work very hard to find separate funding streams that will support all of our staff work that has to be done. So there, there will not be any feeling of either potential for retribution from the state if we litigate against them or government in general or private, private individuals that may be well connected in the, in the state. Uh, and uh, we will be able to, at the same time, uh, protect the organizations by communicating and having potentially the same board of directors. So we will have a unifying factor. We'll just have separate strunting streams and separate staff. Okay, so going back, what, are, what is each doing? What is yeah. each doing now, uh, right now, what are they doing? I am extremely proud of both, but let me tell you, uh, Hawaii Appleseed, briefly, we started on an agenda about three or four or five years ago, and it has to do with food insecurity. We've gotten a significant uh, amount of funding from the Hawaii Community Foundation to create a hunger coalition in our state, uh, and that's now ongoing to try to create how, ways that we could reduce hunger security in a bad way. We're one of the worst in the United States for accessing food, not only for our kids, but for our adults. The second is economic and social justice. We are deeply involved in tax policy modification because if you take a look at what's happening in our state with cost of living and the affordability of housing, the vast number of people that really are desperate for housing, those below 60 or 80 percent of AMI, technical but basically think lower moderate income people, have the less money to, to afford on this escalating price of housing. Especially here, I mean, yeah. Exactly. I mean, we're, I mean, we're the poster child for affordability. Oh, we've got to be the worst. Exactly. Uh, we are. We are. Uh, we are. And we also pay the lowest salaries in the United States when you factor in cost of living. So your low and moderate income people, that's why you have the homeless problem you have in the street, are so uh, 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 challenged to maintain uh, a viable uh, shelter option for themselves uh, that if their life ever gets disrupted, a handicap occurs, an abusive problem occurs, and the family is split up, uh, someone loses their job, uh, you are basically on the streets. So affordability of housing became our central plank, and we've done a lot of work in that area, as well as uh, economic justice. Our economic justice work is primarily through the tax policy advocacy and things like minimum wage and affordable housing. It's a lot of different vehicles, a lot of different ways we're working in affordable housing, both introducing new models, but also advocating in the, sta in the state in the, uh, in the county to make sure that the, the mon enough money is available for a building of affordable housing and the structural problems like the permitting are overcome. We do a lot of advocacy in those three areas, and we're quite visible. We've just created a new budget center for the state, and we've gotten a fair amount of funding from foundations in the state to be able to support that for at least three years. And that will be a research component to take a hard look at some of the issues uh, that are impacting on low and moderate income people from a budgetary perspective and suggest other ways that other states in the mainland have more successfully used revenues uh, to make improvements in low and moderate income people's lives by accessing programs that really do make sense, things like school breakfast. And, th and that's the, the Hawaii the Appleseed. Yeah, that's why Appleseed will be a separate a project. It'll, it's, it's called the Hawaii Budget and, and Policy Center, funded uh, by foundations in Beth Geesting, who was Abercrombie's, Neil Abercrombie's uh, transform, transformational director for health care, is, is running the center for us. And, and it sounds like you have support. Yes, for this. the foundations and some private individuals have been very liberally generous in making sure we have three years of funding to start this effort. This is an effort that is tied up into 43 other budget centers around the United States. It's headed up by a group in Washington, which is the best think tank 
uh, for low and moderate income people. It's called the Center for Budget Program Priorities, CVPP. They have organized these centers about 25 years ago. They started. They're now 43. We're the 44th center. Mm -hmm. So we're joining a massive network of budget centers that really know this work well and will help train us and get us up to speed so we can make a big impact on why our budgets are having problems in terms of meeting the low and moderate income people's needs in this community. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about, well, uh, a lot, but a little bit, about the policy roads that Hawaii Appleseed is going down. We're going to take a break for a minute. We'll be back and talk about Lawyers for Equal Justice and where they are going now. Great. Thank right. you so much for your patience. It's complicated. I it, appreciate it. It's your complicated, but it's, it's, I can understand it, which is a, is a good thing. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll take a, a break and be right back. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of New Japanese Language Show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii. Broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can be the world, you can be the war, you could talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up. Move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Stay in the hall of fame. In the world that's gonna know your name. Welcome back. I'm Mark Schlov, host of Law Across the Sea with Victor Gemignani. Today we're talking about uh, planting some seeds of equal justice. And Victor, uh, we were talking when we left about Hawaii Appleseed and the policies it's advocating and that it appears to have some support. And why? I mean, who cares? I mean, why, why should we care about this? What, what, what is the result of all this mean? I mean, it goes to the fundamental, we talk a lot about values now and the values we're representing to the rest of the world under this current administration. It has to do with our core values. I believed as a young boy growing up in this country that this country believed deeply in equal and fair opportunity to succeed for everybody. That the system of justice would be the balancer of equities. And if someone was being mistreated by anybody, including the government, the system of justice, the courts, would step in and make sure that they were treated equally. I believe that to my core, that this country is so special and so remarkable and so exceptional when it remembers what its true values are, that we are a beacon for everybody because we do provide somewhat an understanding that access to, to a success is possible here. Unfortunately, that access, as you well know, to success requires access to institutions that are normally run by the government, your educational system, your tax system in terms of how much money you have coming in, your employment situation your justice system, your political system, those are all systems that ultimately, educational if I didn't mention it, all have to have access so that you can get the benefits and the, and the opportunities that everyone else that has money and has a good education can obtain. And that's where poor people come in. Because most of our systems in this country, for all intents and purposes, we may not want to admit it, but in the hearts when we go to bed at night, we know it's true, do not provide equal access to our institutions that are critical. One look at DOE will underline that in our state. One look at our tax policy in our state will underline how much money we take out of low income, moderate income people off pocket, as opposed to those that are wealthy that pay hell about half of what our, the low and moderate income people are paying. So those systems need to be changed. If they're not changed, what happens? Well, you see it all over the world when you have evolution that's not allowed to, to uh, exercise its, its, its needs, it explodes. So if we want this country to really feel its citizenship relieves and owns our own system and the values that I think we were created under and I hope we still believe in, you've got to give the low and moderate income people an opportunity to exercise those rights and have advocates like Hawaii Appleseed and Lawyers for Equal Justice when they have been mistreated by the system illegally 
and sometimes on apple seed it's not illegal it's just bad policy you have to have advocates to step in and do this otherwise people have no ownership in their government and we see that happening more and more obviously with lots of indicators like voting voting rolls and dissatisfaction in the country in the direction and that's where lawyers come in too i mean that's the other side of this isn't yes. it lawyers lawyers have a purpose here uh, perhaps yeah. that they didn't know uh, at some point or maybe they know in their core now, lawyers for equal justice. Okay, what's it doing? Uh, we heard a little well, bit about Hawaii Appleseed. Okay, lawyers for equal justice. Where where is that now? Yeah. Well, over the last, we created about 2004. We actually got our first case underway, and since then it's been 14 years. We've done about 12 to 15 cases. Most of them, if people uh, saw our case list, they'd all resonate with people. And we've run off a few. The most recent case was a case against the state because the state had failed over 25 years since 1991 to make any adjustments, illegally by the way, ignored, in the uh, board and care rates that foster parents are being paid. Our foster board parents, uh, foster board care parents are people who take care of our foster take, kids. Take care of kids, young exactly. kids, yeah. been abused and traumatized and are going through all sorts of yeah. emotional issues at a very young stage in their life. These parents have not been given a raise in terms of, and they're all volunteers, by the way. <laughs> They've not been given a raise to support their children uh, since 1991. We brought a case after, after the, the, the foster parents went to the legislature five years in a row, could never get any relief. We finally said enough is enough. We went back and we litigated. It took the case, it took us three years to litigate that case. So, so the, the parents went for five years to pol the politicians. N nothing. Nothing. And it had been stuck wow. at the same rate, the lowest in the United States, $524 since 1991. The legislature knew, the governor knew this was a problem. They right. said, oh, we're going to spend our money on something else. In the meantime, our foster kid, care kids get less and less in terms of the benefits that they're able to contribute you know, to. I'm, I'm sorry, to but achieve. it makes you think, what do they think? What, what do well, they we think? agree. Uh, yeah, okay, agree. I'm sorry, go, go, on. go on. So the tale gets uh, sadder, to be frank with you. We, we, uh, the, after three years, the. Uh, the uh, uh, Department of Human Services uh, and uh, the Attorney General's office comes to us and say, we want to settle this case finally. One day before the case was going to go for trial, they came to us and said, we ought to resolve this case. We said, of course, we agree with you. We went into negotiations. Over two weeks, we negotiated a settlement that could have been negotiated day one when the case was sure. first filed. And it ended up uh, resulting in about $120, $140 increase in the payment. So they went from uh, 524 at about uh, 640 or 700, depending upon the age of the child. Um, we go to the legislature. The governor created this, of course, also. We go to the legislature with the settlement, and they decide not to fund it. That's $8.3 million that they did not fund, that the state had already agreed they should have paid just for the future. Forget about the 21 years, 25 years they haven't made any raises, just for the future payments. Forget about the damages. Exactly. Forget about anything. It's good. So ultimately, uh, uh, they held it up strictly in one, in one committee, the Finance Committee of the House, uh, because they didn't like the attorney's fees that were being charged. And you, again, you asked me who pays for this. Sometimes we're able to get attorney's fees, sometimes not. Micronation case, we got nothing after five years. When we win a case, we're entitled to get attorney's fees from the losing party. We cut our attorney's fees by 65%. We asked for 65% of what we were entitled to. They refused. Uh, I'm sorry, 33% of what we were entitled to. We gave back 66. I'm not going to charge you for 66%. We, we, we had a figure of about 33% of the total amount that we should have gotten for attorney's fees. They wanted it reduced by another $250,000. So the next legislative session that came up, this last one, we reduced it by another $250,000, and our family are finally getting the $8 million. But they were taken for, for one year. They were not allowed to, uh, to get their benefits for their kids of, of, of that $8.3 million, which everyone had agreed was appropriate. That's the kind of kickback we get sometimes from the state. The case before that went on for many, many years. It was the Micronesian health care case that um, the Micronesians were being uh, all health care, including chemotherapy uh, and um, a, a dialysis. And by the way, if you die, die from dialysis, you're going to die. Within a, if you don't get a dialysis, mm -hmm. you're going to die in about a week or two. We had 110 Micronesians here living in Hawaii when the government uh, decided under Linda Lingle to end all chemo, all uh, 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 dialysis, as well as all other, most other medications. So we litigated against that. And by the way, people were given a two-week notice with a notice that didn't go out in Chucky's or Marshallese. And half of our people had no idea what, in fact, it said. So it took us two weeks to bring that case. We ended up, we got a temporary restraining order in federal court, uh, and we went on all the way to the Supreme Court over five years. Luckily, at the end of the five-year odyssey, of, of Barack, Obama, Barack Obama had created the Affordable Care Act, and the Micronesians were able to be folded into the, the Affordable Care Act. So that was the case we brought before. We've also done KPT, Kui Park Terrace, 
uh, Mayor Wright, uh, to uh, the large sec largest and second largest housing projects that were broken in terms of conditions, admittedly so, front page of the advertiser every year in terms of the disgrace, we finally uh, litigated against that and we got a total rebuild of KPT with $150 million of tax policy, of tax credits going in to restore it. And Mayor Wright's on the, uh, the, on the RFP list right now for, for a new uh, pump after uh, Grand Story Development. Okay, we've talked a little bit about those things and you mentioned a lot of times attorney's fees. How do you pay for all of this? And in the few minutes we have left, explain how you pay for it. Where do you get the money? Sure. Are the, do lawyers from the private sector help? Or yes. what, how, how, how does it work? It's complicated. Uh, there was a good part of the time when I ran uh, LEJ in Hawaii Appleseed, I would take deferred compensation for up to a year. I'm paid about $55,000 a year, though, uh, after being practicing law for 50 years, just to give the economics on the, on, on the plate. Uh, we, we really ran out of money. I had a volunteer and myself that were managing this project, but I would continue to work day after day, month after month, waiting for some kind of benefit to come in from, from, uh, from uh, our, our, our funding streams to be able to support it. When you win a case against the federal government, not in all situations, or the state government, not in all cases, but most cases, when you're prevailing party and you've reversed some wrong that's been done, constitutionally protected, you have a right to get a reasonable attorney's fees. So you keep a note of how much you're spending on the time, how many hours you did on this, how many hours you did on that. You submit that to the judge at the end. He will then, or she will and, then, and award a certain amount of attorney fees. Hopefully you, you get the award. Exactly. How, how about pro bono lawyers? Yeah. Do they, we do they come in? We could not exist without pro bono lawyers. I've mentioned litigation. We have done cases that are, I mean, as I said, I can go on and on about the cases we've done. Highly complex. They take a long time to resolve. You're looking at lawyers for equal justice, and I work half time, and I work on a Hawaii apple seed also. So the only way we can do this work is to find pro bono lawyers in town that will take the lead. Do you and get do this way? Yes. And, and one what, firm what, in particular, okay. Alston Hunt, Floyd, Alston, yeah, and, and one Paul. lawyer in particular, Paul Alston, has done the great majority of, of the litigation we've done on the 10, 12 cases we've done. We do it with him. We often bring in mainland partners. For example, the foster care case, I had a mainland partner, one of the largest law firms in the, in the, in the, in the world, Morrison and Foster, uh, that came in. I have a case against the Front Street Apartments right now in Maui because they're being uh, deregulated, wrongfully so. Uh, that case is in federal court, and I have a, a, a major law firm, Hogan and Lavelle's, uh, I think it's the largest in the United States after Denton's, uh, that are proponing uh, pro, uh, 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 pro bono counseling on that. So I put together teams of people, ultimately, that can uh, litigate these cases. Okay, now, in the, in the 30 seconds we have left for our program, You've been doing this for 50 years. This is my 50th year. What have you learned from all this? What can you tell us? You could us? go on for books, but I, the things I've learned basically is that poor people have rights that in most situations are not enforced. There's no political benefit to enforcing most of the rights that are violated against low-income people. And most people in positions of political power uh, in this country or are wanting agencies, uh, governmental agencies that are very large, sometimes have forgotten that low and moderate income people are the majority of our citizens mm -hmm. and they're suffering really badly in this country because their, their systems are broken. And if, if you, I could go on and on about each and, of the systems, and, but they're... And, and they're citizens. They're citizens and, of this country. And, and that's what make... Yeah. And, and doing... Born and raised in our islands. Yeah, yeah. Forget about the ones that came from the mainland yeah. or Micronesians. Yeah. Born and raised in our islands, the people that we represent. You have something like uh, the uh, ninth worst poverty rate in the United States. When you take a look at the supplemental figures in Hawaii, you have a lot of people that are born and raised here that are just really having a tough, tough, tough time. Victor, if uh, lawyers want to help you, they can contact you at uh, lo Lawyers for Equal, Equal Justice. Justice. I'll give you a phone number. Yeah, yeah, what's your phone number? 587-7605. Uh, 587-7605. And they can you also look at Hawaii Appleseed or Lawyers for Equal Justice. Either one of the two will get you okay. to them. And what we would really use to be frank with you is any financial support they may be able to contribute or any research capability they may be interested in contributing to, uh, to our program to help us continue to maintain our viability. Victor, thank you very much. Oh, real pleasure. I thank you so much. appreciate your time today. My pleasure. All right. Aloha, everybody. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with another Law Across the Sea program. Aloha.